Good morning, and welcome to Worthy is the Lamb, a series of lessons going through the book of Revelation. The title of this message is God's Revelation to Thyatira, Part 1. And there's going to be three parts to this message. Uh, the first part will cover the good. The second part will cover their wickedness and sin and all of that. And then we'll have God's judgment and promise upon them. And that will be in the third part. And originally I was going to try and do this as just one part. But then the bad has so much that is required uh, to know so that you can understand what Jesus is saying. And you also see the same with the good. And so it ended up being three messages. So the reference that we'll be in is where we'll be is Revelation 2, 18 through 19. And uh, before we start, and while you're turning there, I will go through the review, which is simply the focus of Revelation is Christ's sovereignty and his glory. So Revelation 2, 18 through 19 says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and, ch and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray that you'd bless this time. May it be for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, the introduction to the church at Thyatira is seen in verse number 18, which the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So, Jesus tells John to write to the church at Thyatira, and in doing so, in the introduction, it shows that, it shows Jesus' power and righteousness. And you see that, by Jesus' power is seen in that his feet were as fine brass. Now, we've talked about fine brass in previous lessons. But in case you do not remember, earlier in the series, the word chocolabano, which is the word translated as fine brass, was discussed. So, the word in the Greek is Chocolimbano. And then you have, uh, we expounded upon that specifically, that it likely might have been the mysterious and mythological Orchichalcum, which, according to Greek writers, was an extremely valuable, bright, strong, and gold colored metal, which was lost to time. So you see Jesus' power in uh, that his feet were as fine brass. And you also see Jesus' power in his eyes being as a flame of fire. So note that it says flame and not flames. I would think because both eyes, it would use flames, but it says here flame. So is it like... Uh, Cyclops kind of uh, thing with the flame of fire being like all over his eyes or in between his eyes. I have no idea. It could be just referring to each eye being as a flame of fire. And 
I honestly don't know why it's singular there, but uh, that's what the Bible says, and that's what it is. That uh, Jesus' eyes were like unto a flame of fire. And you also see Jesus' righteousness, purity, and all-knowing nature in that his eyes were as a flame of fire. And you see that Jesus is powerful and righteous. And he shows that to the church of Thyatira. And he also shows his purity and that he knows everything. And when you look to the bad, that makes a lot of sense. Because God's saying, I know what you're doing, and this is why, and I'm going to judge righteously. So, you do see that righteousness in his judgment as he gives uh, six good things to the church of Thyatira. So, the uh, good is what we'll go to next. And the church of Thyatira, Jesus said six good things. Though they were a church in great wickedness and being led into further wickedness. And there's six things. You could also say that there's just five, but I would say that there is six. And we'll get to uh, why some would say there's five, some would say there's six. But the first good thing that Jesus said about them was that he knew their charity. And the word charity here is translated as agapain, which is translated typically as love. Now, the root word for that is agape, and many of you are probably familiar with that term. And it, for those that aren't, agape love is an unconditional love, and in truth, it's only possible by God through the working of the Holy Spirit. And you might have had people use the term agape as they would phileo, which is a different type of Greek love, which is like a brotherly love or a friendship kind of love. But uh, they might use it uh, as a stronger sense of that. But in truth, the word uh, agape, it's an unconditional love. Now, some scholars would say that agape love is unachievable by humans and that only God can have such a love. And in college, I had many professors that held to that point of view, that it is unattainable. But I disagree, and I will show you in the Bible where it says that. Because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, the Bible says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you might have picked up on the fact that the word love is there. The Bible says, Love your enemies. So, Matthew 5, 44 disagrees with that viewpoint that agape love is unachievable because uh, it uses the word agapodate, which is a different form of the same word for agape. So, it uses agape. So, you're not just supposed to love your enemy as like a friend. You're supposed to love them unconditionally. And that is only possible through the power of God's word working in you and 
the Holy Spirit working in you. Without God, agape love is impossible. But it is possible through God for us to have such a love. And it might be difficult, but it is possible. Or else the Bible wouldn't have used that. That we ought to agape love your enemies, our enemies. The Bible says that. So should we do it? And you see here that the church at Thyatira, they had that sort of love for others. That charity for others. The second good thing that Jesus says about the church of Thyatira is that uh, he knows their service. So the second is their service. The Greek word translated service here is diakonian, which means service. And you might ask, well, why did you have to go back to the Greek if it just means service? Well, the word diakonian, it has implications also. It has implications as to the service. The service could be attendance to church services, aid to other Christians and churches, serving in the office of prophet, evangelist, elder, overseer, and deacons, or teaching and training Christians so that they grow in the Lord and are able to teach others also. So, that one word, diaconian, has all those implications in it. So, it is very likely that the church at Thyatira was following what 2 Timothy 2, 2 said. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Because of the implications of diaconian, or the word translated service, it's logical to assume that the church of Thyatira revolved around its preaching and growth ministries. And when I say growth, I mean growing uh, new Christians in the word of the Lord and teaching them what the Bible says and then helping grow the older Christians so that they are better witnesses for Christ and that they are able to teach others also. And I, th I believe that given those implications that the church at Thyatira, that's what it revolved around, preaching and growing towards godliness. Now, you might say, well, look at all the bad, and we haven't gotten to the bad yet, and the bad's pretty bad. And you might think, well, that would seem to be a contradiction, that they couldn't be trying to grow in godliness and in God's word and be so far off into sin. Well, and we'll get to this in the bad, but you kind of see that not all the church at Thyatira was involved in all the wickedness. Now you have the third thing that Jesus says that's good about the church of Thyatira is their faith. And the Greek word translated here as faith is the word piston. Sounds kind of like a modern word, but it's spelled slightly different. But the word piston, it means conviction. And that word's translated faith in the King James Version, and rightly so. So the church at Thyatira had a strong faith in the Lord. They strongly held their beliefs, and that's the blank there, beliefs. 
Now, we assume that their beliefs were about Jesus and his word, but we do not know for sure from just that word, piston. We do not know. Now, we can guess that that is so because of the context it's in, but it's still an assumption. So this assumption is backed by the fact that Jesus approaches it as good. So if their faith was in something other than God and their strongly held beliefs were something other than God, I do not believe that Jesus would have called it good because that would have been against his nature. And some of the church at Thyatira, they had a strong faith in things not of God. And that's in the bad. So I believe that this assumption is backed by the fact that Jesus approaches their faith as good. That they strongly held to beliefs about God and his word. And praise the Lord for that. We also, as the church at Thyatira, ought to be strong in the word of God and this word of God should matter. And we ought to have strong convictions on what the Bible says and what it clearly says. And there are people that will say they have a conviction on something. And the word conviction with them would mean that it's just what they believe. It's uh, not necessarily backed up by scripture. And... That leads into the Christian liberties thing because we have liberty in Christ. Now, some Christians can do certain things that other Christians can't because of that liberty. Because some, they've uh, grown up a certain way, they can't do certain things. And if they see someone else, another Christian doing those things, they might be offended or they might, that might be a stumbling block to them. And so those Christians actually cannot do that thing because of the weaker Christian and they not wanting to be a stumbling block because being a stumbling block is not good. Now, the church at Thyatira, they had a stumbling block, a big one. And we'll get to her in the bad, but... Praise the Lord that they strongly held to their faith in the Lord. The fourth thing that Jesus said was good about the church at Thyatira was their patience. And if you remember in previous lessons, patience means cheerful endurance. So the church at Thyatira, like all the churches during the first century, would have uh, had persecution. And they would have had trials and tribulations. Well, the church here, they were patient. They cheerfully endured through it for the honor and glory of God. And then the fifth thing that we see is the Bible says, I know thy works. And that's actually where he starts. It's actually where uh, he says the fifth thing it, after patience, those and thy works. So, the fifth thing is their works. They toiled for the cause of Christ with cheerful endurance. Now, there are some things, if you take the last phrase to be attributed to thy works rather than being its own independent thing, which it is not clearly seen that way uh, for or against it, really, in the received text, in the Greek text. And uh, it's not clear either way in the King James Version because in the King James Version, it's got a semicolon, which means it's set apart but it also means it's tied to it in uh, some ways. And we do not know really 
uh, what, how it was supposed to have gone. Is it being attributed to thy works, or is it not? And the last phrase is, and the last to be more than the first. So if it is being attributed to thy works, then when John was writing to the, uh, to the church at Thyatira, their works were greater than the works they had or they were doing when they first formed. And that shows growth in the Lord. That shows growth in the Bible. And that shows growth by letting the Holy Spirit work in their lives. And all Christians need that growth. And it's a sign of being healthy to have that growth. But we do not know for sure that that is what it's meaning here because it's unclear. Now, if you take and the last to be more than the first to not be attributed to their works, then this phrase would denote humility. So the sixth uh, thing that Jesus says is good about the church at Thyatira is their humility. And I believe that you see this being uh, separate because in Mark 10, 29 through 30, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. But m many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. So I take this as being a sign of their humility, that they were humble before Christ, that they were submitted to Christ. And from what we've seen of the good, you kind of get that, that they were wholly submitted to growing in Christ. And praise the Lord for that. But there was great wickedness in that church, in the church at Thyatira. And we'll get to that in the next lesson. They had so much good. They were doing so much for God's glory. But yet there was great wickedness. How sad. But they sought to give God glory. Will you seek to give God glory? Do you seek to give God glory? If you're not doing that, if you're not giving God glory... That's not good. And you can give God glory by doing that which is good for the glory of God as the church at Thyatira did. The church at Thyatira, they sought to glorify God in all their aspects as what it says here in amongst the good things that Jesus says to them. That they sought to give God glory. Will you seek to give God glory? The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. O Christian, will you do so as we go through the book of Revelation?